morning to uh, those who are those who are watching remotely. It is uh, March 28th, and we're in the Gospel of John, in chapter one. And now uh, we've um, we've already watched um, two um, videos. You'll find the links attached, so make sure you take the time to do that concerning the first verse of this powerful uh, gospel, the Gospel of John, and uh, the Lagos of God, the Word of God. So let's um, open with um, prayer. Father, thank you for your faithfulness to us. Lord, we thank you, Lord God, that you are faithful, Lord, and that we can expect, God, um, you to um, speak to our hearts um, great things and new things each time we come into um, open your word. It's an endless storehouse, Lord, of, of, um, of food and uh, nourishment to our souls. It's the bread that we um, depend on, God, each day. We live by every word that comes forth from your mouth. And uh, we know that all the rest that's in this world and in this life is only temporary. But your word, when it brings and finds good soil, brings a seed and brings a life that is eternal and everlasting and, is, and can never take us away and never let us down, but will continue to grow in a complete uh, fruition to what is your plan and your will for us, Lord, in our lives. We're thankful, Lord, that you manifested yourself in this world through the Lord Jesus Christ, who was God eternally and made God real and tangible to us in this life. The Word made flesh. We pray that you'd open our eyes, Lord, to see him more clearly. And um, Lord, without any other distractions or frills or qualifications, but that we'll see you perfectly as you are in perfect light and come to know you intimately in per as you are in perfect love even as John did, and he pursued you more than anything. There wasn't anything in this world that was going to take the place of that um, relationship that he had with you. We pray that you'd make our hearts tender and hungry for more of you, and Lord, hungry for more of your word, which gives us life today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, John chapter 1, I know we've read uh, this passage, we're going to read it again, the first 18 verses again, um, because it is foundational to the whole book and uh, all, all to the gospel itself, and understanding everything else that is in this book and how it all fits together. So, who wants to read? Okay, Ernie, would you, let's cut this in uh, um, half. Um, you read the first, let's say, eight verses, and then uh, 9 to 18. Second. Jen? I got the New Living Translation, if that's okay. All right. Do you, let's see. Um, all right, well, I can give them this. You got the NIV. Okay, John 1. Okay. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life and the, that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God, his name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light, he came only as a witness to the light. true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, 
The world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me was surpass me because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. No one has ever seen God, but God the one and only who is at the Father's side has made him known. All right, so uh, the, um, the commentary calls these 18 verses the prologue of the whole gospel. And in the prologue, it begins verse 1 and verse 18, both make strong, absolute declarations of the deity Jesus Christ, calling him God, equal with God. And then number 14, verse 14, um, gives us the, uh, the medium through which he did that, that God took on flesh, that he, speaking of the word in verse 1, who was with God and was God in the beginning and created all things, took on flesh and became uh, one of us. Actually, the word there in verse 14 is the word that's uh, used for the tabernacle. He tabernacled among us, which is very interesting. Um, who, who, was, uh, who would that have appealed to? Who would have that have spoken to? The Jews. The Jews. The Jews. Isn't it the same phrase that that God used when he told Moses he wanted the tabernacle so that he could dwell among the people? I exactly. It's the same phrase. Exactly. Same term that he, that he tabernacled in. God designed specifically with all its the dimensions and all, all its layout and all the articles that were in there, the tabernacle, which then became a pattern for the temple later on. So that he would have a, there, there would be a physical location, a physical spot where the people could meet with God and where they know that if they're there and if I come there and come on God's terms through his prescribed manner, that I will meet him. He will be there. There's a promise there. How do I know that? Because he made a covenant. And he verified the covenant with blood that he would do this and that he would forever make himself known. And through the people of so Israel, this was for is this was terminology for Israel because they had a promise that God would forever be in their midst. And uh, while they were uh, whether they were in uh, slaves in a foreign country or whether they were in their own land, the promised land, or whether they were in a wilderness in between the two, in no man's land, in and barrenness where there's no water, in dry and bare, that God would be there with them, and He would make them Himself known to them, that they would see Him visibly with their eyes. He promised them that they saw a pillar of fire by night and the pillar of smoke by day, that God would be there. They would hear his voice audibly. And when uh, Moses went up and, uh, and spoke with God as God would speak with a man, 
and they heard his voice when he spoke and they so that they said to Moses please don't let us hear this anymore it's too terrible for us to hear you go talk to him and then come back to us and tell us what he said the voice was too terrifying for them so they that we're taught what we're talking here is what John says in chapter 1 verse 1 of the letter of first John remember how that verse opens up not not unlike the Gospel of John, but in a in a in a tangible. Let's go back and read the first John. First John. After first, after first we'll say Peter. What was from the beginning? That which was from the beginning, that which we have heard with our ears, that which we have seen with our eyes, that which we have beheld and handled with our hands, we've handled it concerning the word of life, the word which brings light. And that life, that life was manifested, brought to light for all to see. Who, were on, who happened to be on the earth at the same time him, saw, saw him, walked with him, beheld him. You saw the word of life when you were with him. And handled what we saw with our eyes, handled with our, and he's talking about walking and talking with the Lord Jesus Christ. We were walking and talking and handling and seeing and hearing with our own eyes and ears the word of life that spoke everything into existence. That's what John says. The one who tabernacled among men, that if you were in his presence, you were in God's presence because God was with men, that is what we declare to you and what we're giving to you. This one, who's, that's the one who we're proclaiming to you. We're declaring this one who is God tabernacled with men. And that, that, um, that was that this that, that we proclaim to you the eternal life, a life which is eternal, which is infinite, has no beginning, and it has no end. It is forever and it is eternal, because God Himself has no beginning and has no end. He's the first and the last. And so what proceeds from him and his words also will be eternal. Guess what? They'll never change. Because he never changes. And he is perfect. And whatever is expressed by him. His mind and heart will be perfect. It will not need to be changed, and it will give life. That is the one we proclaim to you, no less than that. This wasn't just a good man and a prophet with a good vision that we all need to take listen to. This was the word of life himself. And that, make no mistake about it, that he was God in the flesh. He was, look what he says in verse 2, we proclaim to you this eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested or brought to light. Manifested means to shine the light on and bring it into appear, to, to cause to appear to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you that you also may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the, <coughs> excuse me, with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. So, <clears throat> what John says in, in uh, verse 14, uh, gospel, in the Gospel 114, that He, back there again, the Word became flesh. Um, he didn't become the Word. No, n notice, this is very clear and he's clear. John he begins the first the first three verses of the gospel saying that he always existed. The word did, uh, Jesus didn't become the word and he didn't just he didn't begin to exist when he was born from Mary. He eternally existed forever with God who always existed and never had a beginning and he never ages because there's no time with God. He he transcends time and he transcends space. So what John is do, doing here is he's giving he's giving the Jew uh, a manifest sign that everything that they would have ever expected to hope in a Messiah is embodied in Jesus Christ. He's also giving to the the Greek the intellectual uh, 
pagan, and the Greeks epitomized that with the philosophy. But the understanding that uh, we've got something that transcends time and space, and therefore gives meaning to all of life and explains who we are because we are proclaiming a person who, who transcends time and space. Now that itself is something to sit there and ponder for a while. How in the world can you tell me, the skeptic might say, that somebody who transcends time and space, who is bigger than time and space, can be embodied in a body that does have a beginning and has an end. And he was limited by time and space. That is the question. That's the question that boggled the minds even of the Jews, and they could not accept it. But they, if they were going to be true to the, to the scriptures and believe what uh, Moses and David and the Psalms and the prophets Isaiah and others had spoken of Messiah, they would have had to conclude that he existed, for example, before David did. Remember Jesus quoted Psalm 110. How can you say, how can David have called him son? How could David have called him Lord when God called the Messiah his son? How can he be his Lord that preceded him and be his son at the same time? You answer me that question, Pharisees, and then I'll answer you your question about who I am. The, it, it boggles the natural mind because it boggles, it, it, it precedes and it transcends physical, our physical existence. But you know what? It's not inconsistent with reason and logic because your very soul transcends your body. You're, you know that you are more than just your body. How do I know that? Because the scriptures tell us that for one thing and because so does my experience. <laughs> that um, you're going to leave this body when your body expires, when your body is done through death. And the scriptures tell you that even while you're in this body, there's nothing that will satisfy you. It tells you that, uh, I always use uh, Ecclesiastes 3.11, God has placed eternity within our hearts. And nothing is going to be big enough to fill that space except the God who is eternal and infinite. And anybody, there are people, sure there are plenty of people who deny that, but they're pretending. They're putting on a, a facade. They're pretending that this is all there is because they don't want to answer to something bigger. But in their heart of hearts, when they, all the lights are out and it's dark and there's no one else around but them, they want their, their there's got to be something more, and I need something more than this, because nothing in this life will have ever answered my deepest dark needs. God has done that, and Christ brings that, and he brings that light. He's the true light that shines to all. So, um, why we could... Um, the meaning of these verses is, is powerful and profound and um, so the, the, the John starts off the gospel immediately and clearly declaring that Jesus is more than a man. He's God. He's God in the flesh. And of course that is exactly what the only accusation that they could make at his trial. It's accusing him. This can't be. And to say that would make you equal with God, to make you equal with God as far as we're concerned. If you're just a man, you're not God, and therefore you're blaspheming. And they refused in that reasoning to believe the scriptures and to receive what God is. And then that's what just exactly what Jesus told the Pharisees. You are doing what your fathers did. You're rejecting the one. You're rejecting the words of the prophets whom he sent because of your traditions. And you're refusing to see and receive the one that God has given you. So therefore, you're missing the call that God is giving to you in your life. And by doing that, you are fulfilling the blood of all the prophets all the way back to Cain who killed his brother Abel all the way to uh, the one that he mentioned at the end, um, this uh, um, 
Zechariah that killed uh, this uh, prophet between the temple and the mount. At the end, uh, the, on all the blood, blood in between are, are on you who, have now, who now deliver the Son of Man up to be crucified. So you're, you, you are, in, in other words, you who call yourself God's anointed, you, in fact, are rejecting the God who made you and called you to be separate from the world. You will e either, when he appears, you have the choice to either accept and believe and receive by faith or to reject and, and to, this is what the lack of faith does. A lack of faith is actually a, a choice to reject and in rebellion say no to God. There will be no middle ground because there are no other choices but those two when faced with the truth of the light. Right? And God will not allow no other choice. And that's why it has to be the world as we're going through it. And guess, uh, guess who got the revelation? Guess who got the book of Revelation? The revelation of who, first of all, the first five chapters see him in all of his glory and majesty and everything that all the rest of us want to see blown away for five chapters about just the vision of Jesus Christ and then after that comes the consummation of how all of history is going to pan out at the end and how why that has to be so that all men who ever lived will have to make that choice yea or nay to the one that God has sent in their life I will choose him and the redemption and the salvation that he gives to me and pull me out of this bondage to sin and the ultimate destruction that's going to come on all the earth because of sin. Or I will choose to die with this world and its destruction because I don't want that redemption. And, uh, and it's ultimately pride that won't allow you to enable you to humble yourself and... Uh, and repent and receive um, somebody outside of yourself as the answer for your life. And it's love that pursues you. It's love that made God pursue man. It's love that God sent his son, John 3, 16, into the world. That's the motivation. It wasn't a need for subjects. It wasn't a need to bring justice to um, to man's unrighteousness, those things are all going to happen. But more uh, reluctantly, God does not delight in punishing man for their wickedness. He would rather delight to see the wicked redeemed. And so much, how do I know that? He proved it. He took the punishment and the wrath of God against and the judgment against all unrighteousness on himself and paid it in full. And that's the one that we proclaim. This one, Jesus Christ. He was in the beginning with God. He, he was with God and he was God. I always use, this is, this is one uh, good verse that's uh, well used for the Trinity because you have the Father and you have the Son distinct from each other. The one is not the other. The other, the son is not the father. The father is not the son because they are with each other side by side. But yet, then the, the next phrase says the word was with God and then the next phrase says the word was God. So here they are, they are one with each other, but yet they're distinct from each other. Same with the spirit. They are all equally God. They are all also distinct from each other. So uh, there's a um, Trinity verse there for those who uh, don't want to see it. There, uh, we still have some anti-Trinity people. And then look at verse 18. There's a verse here too that um, if you have a NIV study Bible, which I mentioned last time, last couple times, um, get that, get that, we need, you, that's the, what we're going to be using to, as a text. Uh, the study notes, 
are, are critical to helping us, like, like in verse 1. Yeah, there's a little article there on the Greek word lagos and what that word meant. I meant to look at that a little bit to give us a clearer picture. <coughs> but look at verse 18 in the study note here, uh, the NIV Study Bible, the original 1984. God, the only one. Look at this. Is an ex, this, the note says this is an explicit declaration of Christ's deity. C one fourteen and the notes on three sixteen and also the notes on Romans nine five. He has made him known. Um, Sometimes the Old Testament people are are said to have seen God, but we are also told that no one can see God and live, Exodus 33, 20. Therefore, since no human being can see God as he really is, those who saw God saw him in a form that he took on himself temporarily for that occasion. Now, however, Christ has made him known once and for all. Um, but look at um, that phrase, God the one and only. In the NIV, no one has ever seen God, but God the one and only who is at the Father's side has made him known. It calls Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, God, the one and only, he was talking about the, the one, the only begotten of God, the only one who has ever begotten directly from God because he proceeded from God and from God's very own essence. God made himself into a man taking on human flesh. It, ma it makes it absolutely clear. It calls the only begotten God right there in that phrase. Now there's many other passages like in Hebrews chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1 and chapter 2, the folk that, uh, that just also tell us the same thing. The scriptures are full of uh, passages. Uh, and, and in John, it's... The, the, uh, the Gospel of John itself, as we go through it, plenty of declarations where Jesus declared himself God in the flesh, equal with the Father. Um, we need to be familiar with those, so when the Jehovah's Witnesses come back yeah. and on your door, or the yeah. Mormon missionaries, you can uh, clearly uh, give them these verses that you can't take away the deity of Christ. I thought it was interesting, even in one one, it twice it says the word was with God. Like, why bother putting that in there if they were the, if there was no Trinity? You could have just said in the beginning was the word, and um, and the word was God. Mm -hmm. But twice it says the word was with God in the in the first verse. Yeah, right. but why bother putting that in there if, it, if they were just if they were there was no Trinity if they're both the same, you know? Right. But twice in the first verse. The word was with him. Yep. Yeah, and that that itself would, um, uh, even if they were still yet slow to understand um, the deity of Christ, just the fact that he was there with God in the beginning before there was time, that itself would say something that he's he's more than he's he's more than us for sure, but he's even more than the angels mm -hmm. because they were created. Right. And we're talking about somebody who was, even if he was sitting at God's right hand, he was somebody who wasn't created. He was an uncreated being that existed eternally. And that's quite a concept to imagine. I remember in one book one time, imagine what it was like before creation. Nothing to even stand on. You know what I mean? You can't, you, you can't you know. How do you imagine a universe or whatever? There was no universe before anything was created. No, nothing. And even right. then, Jesus was there yeah. before anything was first made. When you think about that, uh, that the one who is self-sufficient, he doesn't need okay. anything to stand on. He yeah. is. You know, what I mean? but, you know, think of Yahweh, the I am that I am, the self-existent one mm -hmm. from whom all life proceeds. Yeah. Now let's take it very simply. When we, and you and I, we're people created in God's image and likeness so we can get a little bit of a picture of what God might be like just because, you know, God has graciously 
uh, revealed himself to us in special revelation through his word and through Christ, but also in creation. Uh, he has made us sons and daughters. You and I don't come into existence unless we're conceived through another physical mom and dad. I don't care what the liberals are saying today about 32 genders or 700 plus genders. You can pick up any skeleton in the grave sites of every person that's ever lived on this planet and you can identify whether it was a male or a female. And everyone that's born is still going to be listed on that birth certificate as a male, gender, or female. And unless we have those male, and that's what God said, he made, made man in his image and likeness, male and female, he created them in his image and likeness. And then a man leaves his father and mother, and cleaves into his wife, the two then which were two now become one, and it starts all over again. So we have this beautiful imagery from our very nature of how we were created to understand first of all what it means to be sons and daughters in relation to somebody who's already there before us and has already walked the path ahead of us that we can learn from and then we get to experience parenthood itself just like God is a parent to us to turn around and bring some other human thinking reasoning being with a will Yes, I will do it. No, I'm not going to do that. No, I'm not. You know, and then and to interact with that to bring that same other one into a mature person to create in the image of God. We get to experience um, all of that. So, question: How do you communicate as a son to a parent or a daughter, and as a parent? to someone younger than yourself. How in the world do you communicate truth and value and um, just knowledge from one person to another? Through speech. Okay, through, through speech, and um, which is an interesting term because um, unless you get a little bit deeper into the scriptures. I, I did a study once, I did a sermon once, just on Ephesians 5, 5.14, I think it's 5.14, or is it 4.15? It says, speaking the truth in love. Mm -hmm. And then so we'll, we, uh, we'll grow together into full maturity of Christ. But the words speaking, and then it's a King James Version we're using there, is in italics. Uh, it really isn't there in that uh, context. And that truth in love. It's truth in love. He's using the word truth and verb as a verb, and we don't do that in English. Mm -hmm. Truth is an is a entity. It's a noun. When we look at truth as a noun. But here Paul, the apostle, say, truth in love, this is how we speak. So our, our conversation towards others has to do with what we are. You are going to speak the loudest and the clearest message to other people by your being, by what you are. And guess what kids learn? They watch what you do and they copy exactly the way you're doing it and the way you speak. And if I use my hands, I'm looking at my kids and they're using their hands. <laughs> or, or the inflection of your tone. You ever notice we got, we were with our, um, um, little girl who had her seventh birthday yesterday, her, our uh, granddaughter, Davidson. And um, you can watch, and then there's, um, and then there's a five-year-old and a one-year-old. They had three. And you listen to how they talk. They use the same, not only the same terminology, because that's what they've learned from mom. Mom's homeschooling them, by the way. So that's even... Um, but the way they say the words and the way they, <laughs> in between the sentences and how they speak, they're talking just like mom and dad. Exactly, um, they sound like their parents. And their understanding of the way the world is, is going to come through that. And their view of themselves, how they view their self, comes from how their parents view them. It's, 
how you communicate and what you communicate to people, first of all, comes through what you are. Paul says in, in Ephesians 5, verse 1 and 2, like dearly beloved children, um, copy what you see in me as an example. And why that? Because children copy and do what the adults around them do. Don't do as I <laughs> don't do as I do. Do as I say. Don't do what I do. And guess what? Kids aren't going to listen to that. Mm -hmm. They 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 see what you are, and but so your words have to be in line with truth and reality of what you are. Kids will always see through the facade at some point in time. You can play the game as if. You can, you, pre, you can pretend to think that you can teach them one thing, but then when they're not around, you have a different standard. And they will, be, they will grow up being frustrated and their inner needs not being met at home, if that's the case, because eventually they'll see through it. And they'll look to other people who will come and see them as they really are. Because they desperately want somebody with whom they can have a relationship that they can trust in intimately um, and that's the way God has made us yeah I, I'm sorry I just, just thought of Psalm 19 when you're talking about the word speak in that passage that the creation day after day pours forth speech obviously the trees aren't talking but they're speaking by showing forth God's glory yeah it's kind of the same thing in my head anyway. right I thought it was, C.S. Lewis brings up, you know, especially when our children can't speak yet, or that we pretend they know. We pretend that they can understand us. Yeah. And eventually the pretense becomes reality when they start talking back to us, you know, yeah. I mean, using language. And I remember with Dobson talking about the point to how they watch us, he said, you watch your television program with your children and something questionable comes on, they look to you to see if you're going to change that channel. Yeah. And we're not. Right, right. Their eyes are on you. That's right. And they're going to ex expect that. Um, gee, I hate that we run out of time. We're just opening the door on the word logos. So the word logos is, it's the word for word. And the word, I just let, let me just uh, say that we're going to have to come back to this. Um, but the word for logos, Jesus, it's one of his titles. It's one of his names. In fact, it's the name on his thigh when he returns in Revelation chapter 19. He's coming on a white horse with his same son, and on his thigh is written this word, the name, the Logos of God, the Word of God. Um, that's who he is. He is the Word. And it was the Word that was made flesh, and it's the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. He himself, Christ, is that Word of God. And what is the Word? God's Word. If God could speak, a word is an expression verbalized out loud, audibly, to communicate truth to somebody else, to communicate reality to somebody else. So if God could speak and he wants to communicate who he is to somebody, what he would have to do is express himself in an audible way. Now we have language. But God doesn't need language, okay? If God just spoke and said, by a thought, let there be light, let there be earth, let there be seas, let there be the heavens, the moon, sun, stars, and all this, and he spoke it into existence, it became because God's uh, thought acted on by his will that he chose to have something happen, and it became a reality. Jesus was the full expression of who God was. That's what word means. So that when he spoke, he expressed himself completely. So that when we see Jesus, we see the complete and full, unrestricted, unrestrained expression of who God is. That's why Hebrews chapter 1 says he's the radiance of his glory. That's what Logos is. We live by every logos that comes forth from the mouth of God. Don't minimize the word um, like some Pentecostals do. The experience is more important than the word itself. 
and would say, we don't worship the word, do we? Do you worship your Bible? Yes, no, I don't worship the paper and the ink. I worship the word that was made flesh. He is the second person of the Trinity, and we worship him. The spoken word that I speak only is as good as the, the word that, I, that is in me, that I'm believing, that I've received, and what's coming out of me. In that, it, how true it is to him and to his word. So, never minimize that, the logos of God. Well, we'll pick this up again. Uh, it's a good discussion. So, Are we even class next week for the brunch? Uh, no, yeah, to, next week is Easter, isn't it? All right, so we um, good point. Glad you mentioned that. Um, so next week, we're going to have to take a break. We'll see you back in two weeks. And, um, um, well, so much for this morning. <laughs> it's been good. Lord, thank you for um, your words that give us life. Thank you, Lord, that you came, Lord, to um, reveal to us who you are and that your word gives us life. May we hunger, Lord, for your words today. And may we do the things to turn off every other voice and every other solicitation of every other word just to hear your word and to sit there and feed on the words that give us life for your words are spirit and their life i pray that you uh, lord fill us with your spirit let us lord have the joy of your salvation that go out through us and from us as we go into this week lord remembering your death and that we are alive because Jesus is alive today, and our life is hidden with Christ in God, and we are together with him in the heavenlies. Bless our families, and may we be a blessing to them, and may your light flow out of us to our families, <laughs> our sons, our daughters, our grandkids. Father, in all this we ask, for your glory and for your name's sake, build your church as you would have us to be built in you. Lord, and bring us to the maturity. Do your work in us, Lord, as you would. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you.